Okay, so, uh, so I think everyone was here for the first half, and you didn't just show up for the second half. And um, I've got about 15 more minutes on matrix processes. Just to tell you where we are, I'm going to talk um, uh, very quickly about energy optimization, and this will introduce the concept of time evolution, uh, imaginary time evolution. Then I'll say something briefly about how symmetries occur in matrix product states. Um, and I won't go into the classification of states in topological order that can be expressed in, in tensor networks, but the intro to that, so the introduction is to understand how symmetries occur in the states. Um, and then from there, I will then move on to general tensor networks. So everything so far has been the simplest tensor network. Okay, so. So energy optimization. So I introduced the idea of uh, compression, which is to minimize the difference between two states, two matrix product states. Now, it's very often that you want to uh, just find the, find the ground state of a problem. So you can think about that as an energy optimization, minimizing the energy with respect to the elements of the matrix product state. Um, and so this is just a minimization of this problem, right? The, the energy subject to normalization. All right, it's essentially very similar mathematically to the problem of compression because uh, uh, very similar. And there are two types of arguments that are used. One is a local update, and one is a variational sweep. Okay, so DMRG corresponds to truly minimizing this in an optimal way, where I use the full environment, so all the tensors are updated with information from the other tensors. And then in the local update scheme, I just change my tensors locally. And this is the, this is the other famous algorithm, uh, time evolving block decimation, imaginary time evolving block decimation. So I will talk very quickly, just one slide on the margin energy minimization. So it's the same idea. I take this energy expression, I find the gradient. And so this is the first term, psi h psi, differentiate respect to the tensor. So the tensors disappeared, minus the norm, the psi psi, differentiate like this. Um, and in DMRG, I always work in mixed canonical form. So if I'm optimizing with respect to psi 2, then in mixed canonical form, the sites to the left and the sites to the right contract to the identity. So this is just a unit matrix. So this looks now like an eigenvalue problem because this is something times psi 2 is energy times psi 2. It's just an eigenvalue problem. Okay, so it has an eigenvalue problem. So I can determine the optimum site tensor by solving an eigenvalue problem, where this funny Hamiltonian is in the old DMRG language called the superblock Hamilton. But it's just this picture here that you stick site 2 in. All right, so that's DMRG. And then, OK. okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so let's now do time evolution. OK. so. Um, so what, by time evolution, I mean I propagate a state with respect to a Hamiltonian. So you, you, you're familiar with real-time evolution. I apply a unitary transformation to the original state to move it forward. Um, now, in imagined time evolution, you, you, which is uh, uh, the algorithm I'm going to discuss, that there's no real difference. You just replace i by 1. Okay, so everything I'm saying can be done for real-time or imaginary time. Uh, but in the context of... Uh, um, energy minimization, if you propagate something in imaginary time, it's, it's sort of like taking a system and cooling it so it goes towards the ground state. So this projects the ground state long time. You might have heard of this, heard of this in Brian's talk, Diffusion of Calm. Okay, so how do I do time evolution uh, using, the, using the language of matrix product states? So in a general sense, it's very simple, right? So you take your matrix product state, your initial state, and you apply the time evolution operator which for small time, which gives you a new matrix product state with larger bond dimension, larger entanglement. Then you do a compression to control the entanglement growth, and you evolve it forwards in time again. And you just keep doing this. So that's this picture here. So this is the time evolution operator, just so a general operator. Here I'm evolving forwards in time by acting on the state. This gives you a new matrix product state with more entanglement. Since you don't want the entanglement to run away, if you run out of resources, you compress it to a new matrix product state, and you just repeat. Okay, so this is the general 
time evolution algorithm. Um, and there's a special case of this algorithm which is used a lot in lattice problems, which I'll uh, say now, which is if I have a Hamiltonian which is of a short range form, so I forgot the brackets here, but this is just a Heisenberg Hamiltonian, then there's a special efficient way to do this time evolution. So if I think about e to the Hamiltonian for small time step delta, then in the Trotter decomposition, do you know the Trotter decomposition? So the exponential of the sum is the product of the exponentials of each of the terms with a small error. That, can, that goes to zero. Um, so if I have a Hamiltonian that acts on the bonds, then this is the part of the Hamiltonian that acts between site 1 and site 2, site 2 and site 3, and so forth. Okay? So I can do time evolution for short-range Hamiltonian just on the bonds individually, rather than having to think about the whole system. And it's a well-known trick. And in particular, if I have a lattice and I'm applying a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, then a nice way to think about it is to do time evolution first on the even bonds, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then on the odd bonds, and then the even bonds, and then the odd bonds. So in one complete cycle where I've done both evolution on the even and the odd bonds, it's equivalent to applying the whole Hamiltonian. So, so that's this picture here. Here I have a matrix product state at the bottom, written in the Vidal gauge. And then I time evolve on the even bonds. So I apply operating even bonds, and then time evolve on the odd bond, time evolve on the even bonds, odd bonds. And the combination of even and odd, this is one time step. Okay, so this is the time evolution on the even bonds, odd bonds, even bonds. Okay, now the point of this, the reason for introducing all this stuff is that this is, uh, gives rise to uh, this. Uh, time evolution scheme, which acts just on even bonds and odd bonds separately, is very easily uh, 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 combined with a compression algorithm, the SVD compression algorithm that I introduced earlier. And that's the basis of time, ev of time evolving block designation that I'll introduce. Okay. So the basic idea is if I time evolve on the even bonds, then, then there's nothing that I'm doing changing the bond between 2 and 3. So I only change the entanglement between sites 1 and 2 and sites 3 and 4 separately, but in this time step I don't change the entanglement between sites 2 and 3. And so that means that when I do a compression, I can truncate the bond dimension of this independently from the bond dimension of this, because nothing is being changed on the bond in between. Okay, so the algorithm is the following. I time evolve on this even bond and I do a, com I do a compression to get a new bond, to get a new representation, I time evolve in this bond, and I get to do a compression to get a new representation, and these two can be done independently. So, so are you saying that it, the SVD compression is is the is now not a, 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 a sort of an approximation, but it's perfect, and that's what makes this splitting good, or is it? Yes, in this case, SVD compression is the optimal thing yes, to do. That's what I um, but what you've not, the reason why you suddenly, suddenly, suddenly become optimal is that I've time evolved yep. like, like half the Hamiltonian and then compressed and time evolved the other half. Okay. All right. So this is a TBD algorithm. So if you ever see TBD, this is what this is doing. Okay. I'm going to uh, mention now briefly boundary conditions. I'm going to skip the internet algorithm because I think it's probably too technical. So, um, so I just mentioned, this was a question at the beginning, that you, have, you can have finite matrix product states, but I can put another loop around. So this would be a matrix product state with periodic boundary conditions. Or you could have an infinite matrix product state. That just means that inside your head, you're repeating these things forever. I mean, you can't draw it, obviously, but you think of them going on forever. <laughs> OK. Um, and the interesting thing about a tensor network representation is that you can actually work. Yes, go. Oh, sorry. So previously you said that the finite matrix product states already the most general form. So does it mean for the periodic matrix product state can also be written as finite matrix? Yeah, actually, this can always be written like this. But in a periodic system, um, the bond dimension would be smaller in this. If, if it's on a ring, by theory, it has been on a ring. So these bond dimensions would be smaller than if I rewrote it. Because, 
Yeah, because there's some entanglement between site one and site three, which here you'd have to communicate via site two. Yeah. Okay. So I would just say one quick thing about infinite matrix product states or infinite tensor networks. And so the night, but I won't discuss the argument because like, it'd be too confusing. I think at this time. So the the cool thing about infinite tensor networks, or infinite matrix product states, is when you're writing down the wave function, you're re really writing down the wave function in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, it's in your head, but inside your head is a wave function thermodynamic limit because you just uh, imagine the system is translation variant. Then it's just characterized by one tensor, repeated forever. Okay, and so working this formalism, it's very easy to work with thermodynamic limit because you just change the one tensor, and then your head can repeat it forever. And so algorithms that are algorithms for infinite tensor networks really work in the thermodynamic limit. They don't have finite side effects, and that's one of the cool things about this formalism, and in particular, local algorithms like TBD. Do you notice TBD, I thought about it as doing a time evolution on two sites and then a compression. That's what I mean by locals, only acting on a finite number of sites at a time, are very easy to generalize to the infinite uh, tensor network case, to the third dynamic limit. Now, I won't show this generalization, but it's here. All right. So let me, because I want to quickly move on to things beyond major process. So now let me quickly say something about symmetries. Okay, so what's a symmetry? So, um, so a symmetry uh, is associated with a group, and so if you have a global symmetry of your problem, then there's some global symmetry group. And if you have a global symmetry group, then the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are classified by the irreducible representations, and I can label those by some numbers, and those numbers are the quantum numbers. Okay, so quantum numbers are just the irreducible representations of the group, and so if I have a U1 group, that's, that's the, what, what I would normally call particle number symmetry, but it's equivalent to being invariant under phase rotations. Um, then uh, then so the basis can be labeled by the irreps, which are just labeled by numbers, integers. Okay? So U1, there's a particle number, and so I can label my basis states by this additional integer. This is the number of particles in the state. Uh, if I have SU2, for example, spin one half symmetry, uh, then I have some different integers, um, and so the, 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 the basis states are labeled, say, by the angular momentum and its projection on, the, on one axis. Right. And so if I have, this is just general quantum mechanics, if I have a total state that's, that transforms like an irreducible representation, it's associated with good quantum numbers, that means that I can write my wave function and label it by a set of numbers that, that introduce the symmetry. Okay, so these are symmetries which are associated with transformations of the basis, of the actual. So if I'm thinking about my wave function in graphical form, there are physical indices. I've always drawn them pointing upwards. Okay? Those are the n1, n2, n3. Okay? And these, are, these quantum numbers are associated with, transform, with properties associated with these physical indices. Okay. So, so the real question that one Comes, that then comes to mind is, if these physical indices have some transformation properties, what about the bond indices? Okay, what are the symmetries of the bond indices? And so the simple answer is that the bond indices can always be labeled uh, by the same representations as the physical indices. So in other words, if the physical indices have a U1 symmetry, you can think about particle number then you can always think about there being a part effective particle number on the bond indices. Or if there's an SU2 symmetry, so it's with the physical indices, there's an associated angular momentum or quantum number you can think on the bond indices. Now, there are more bond, that now the bond indices can, there can actually have more degrees of freedom than the physical indices. The physical indices, think about a physical index on the, or for a spin system, it's just as two degrees of freedom, right? Spin up and spin down. The bond dimension can be very large. And so it's possible for there to be additional quantum numbers associated with the bond indices that are not immediately apparent from the physical indices. And those are the topological quantum numbers. Okay, so that's, and that's what I'm going to say about topology. Right. But it's just a bigger object, so it has possibly more symmetry. Simple way to say. Um, so, 
So if I have a tensor here, and it has possible number symmetry, uh, then, OK, so this, so, uh, or if it has SZ symmetry, like a spin, spin up or spin down, then these bond indices here can be labeled by the same kind of quantum numbers. Um, and in fact, for abelian symmetries, there's a very simple conservation rule, which uh, basically you can work with major chart states where by sum up the quantum numbers, you always get zero. So, um, so, if I, so I have to draw arrows to say which way quantum numbers are going into a tensor. And so if a, this quantum number is going in like this, and this bonding is, bonding is like this, then the symmetry condition is tensors that the sum, that the elements are only non-zero if the, in, the quantum number of the indices of the tensor add up to zero, or in equals out. Right? So this is what we call putting arrows on the matrix product. Okay. Very technical. Okay. So that's symmetry. Yes? So here is just like yeah, this is a charge conservation to be one to be charge. Yes. I'm confused about global versus local. Global versus local. Okay, so for an it's abelian like group global, I thought that would be just some number for the entire wave. Yeah, yeah, so for abelian symmetry, then I can break the global symmetry into local symmetry. Right, so so my total partial you number state only has one symmetry. I mean you won You have a gauge in So there's a yeah. There's a global U1 symmetry, and I can classify, uh, I can work with local objects, which I classify by irreps of the local U1 symmetry. Which is not a symmetry of the local wave. Which the total wave function doesn't transform as an irrep of the local U1 symmetry, but I'm classifying. Just the degree of freedom happens to have yours isolated from everything else. That's it's just like U1 global is like, can be thought as U1 plus U1. That's a U1 local. Yes, yeah. that's right. And the, so the total. Uh, so okay, how can I put it? So if there's a total U1. Question is, are you in line with the symmetry group? No, no. So so okay. So uh, let's just think of possible numbers. Very simple. Yeah. Let's think of particle numbers. Yeah. But let's imagine you you scramble things. Yeah. So that so that global particle numbers are not the same as local particle numbers. Yeah. But there was no sense in which the flow of particles. Sites yes. has to balance because the Hamiltonian is actually hopping over several sites. Yeah, so, 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 uh, so to, um, okay, so let's take possible numbers, a very concrete example, okay? So if I have global U1 symmetry, then my eigenstate, my total eigenstate, might has a well defined integer possible number 10, okay? Um, all I'm saying is that locally, now to think about constructing this state, which has 10 particles for the total lattice, I can work in a site basis where the site basis is either zero particles or one particle. So the site basis, the basis elements of the site have well-defined particle numbers. That's just the basis choice. That's a choice of basis. I'm choosing a choice of basis which is classified by irreps of the local one energy. And that's sufficient. And then, and then I work, and then that I can classify these indices here as also as having some part. Question? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. So basically, you're saying it's an on-site symmetry. It has to be a symmetry that doesn't mix the sites. Has to uh, can be represented by acting on every site in the symmetry. I like time reversal. Yeah, it's so not a symmetry of the, so, you know, it's not a symmetry of the total state, but I'm thinking about how this local sites transform according to a local symmetry. But like a site, the site basis for possible has two elements, and those actually transform like different irreps, like zero, no particle, yeah. one particle actually transforms. Yeah, so you cannot do that for translational symmetry. Yeah, so you can ask, well, how is translational symmetry encoded in the matrix product state? Yeah, so it's not, it, it doesn't translate into something on the point. Even SU2 is not a cool thing. OK. All right. So got to the end of matrix product states. And what we've discussed is this. OK. So now for the final part of the lecture, let me now talk about tensor product states and mirror. And 
And um, actually, the discussion here will not be as explicit, both for reasons of time and also because a lot of things are very similar to what happens in matrix growth states. OK. So this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about, PEPs and mirror. So first, I'm going to introduce PEPs. PEPs is just a generalization of matrix product states, the direct generalization from one dimension to n dimensions in the most obvious way possible. And most things about PEPs, you can think of using the same kind of ways you think about matrix product states. But, but to illustrate some of the differences, I'm going to consider the problem of contracting in PEPs, which is actually very non-trivial. Um, that introduces the tensor renormalization group, which is a way to contract PEPs. But, um, and that, but I'm using this particular way to build to introduce the idea of entanglement renormalization, which will then go to the mirror. So we sort of derive the mirror. And then if there's some time at the end, I, I, you know, all this episode has been very formal, so I'll just show you some application. OK, so, so that's a matrix product state. It consists of a set of tensors stuck together in a line. It looks appropriate for one dimension. And one way in which I can quantify the fact that it's appropriate for one dimension is through entanglement. So if I cut out a section of a matrix product state, so I cut out four sites in the middle, well, that's L sites in the middle, and I ask how much entanglement is carried in this state between this, this inner region that I've cut out and the outer region, um, to, to carry it, to count out, to count how much entanglement is carried, you just essentially count how many bonds are cut, assuming all the bonds are of the same dimension. And so the number of bonds cut is independent of the number of sites in the middle. And so the amount of entanglement uh, uh, that is efficiently described by matrix product state is order one independent of the, uh, is order of constants, just a constant, independent of the size of the region that you're cutting out. Now, this is an example of an area law, but because a constant is the surface area in one dimension. Okay? So we say matrix product states describe area law entanglement in one dimension. OK, so then we now draw a 2D version of a matrix product state. So it just looks like a matrix product state, but the tensors now have more indices, and I've glued them together. So this is on a two-dimensional lattice, and glue the tensors together in a two-dimensional way. This is a PEPS. Um, and if I now cut out a region of the PEPS, imagine this to be a square. I was just too lazy to draw the other side. Um, then this would be an L by L square. And if I ask how much entanglement is encoded in the PEPS between the inner and the outer region of the PEPS, I ask how many bonds do I cut? And you notice I'll cut order L bonds. So the entanglement that is efficiently encoded in the PEPs is order L, where L is the boundary of the region. And this, is again, is the area in 2D. So area in 2D is just proportional to the boundary. Um, so PEPs are a generalization matrix product state, but they're basically the same thing in the sense that they both generate area law entanglement. So PEPs is just a generalization matrix product state to, to carry area law entanglement in 2D and 3D, or n dimensions. OK, so PEPs are, in many ways, very similar to matrix product states. I mean, they're just matrix product states with more bonds. Um, but, but because a network is more complicated, it's got cycles in it, this, this means that there are many operations in PEPs that cannot actually be done exactly. For a matrix product state, I was showing you how you compute the overlap, how you compute the energy. You just take the two things and contract them, and then you can just actually do that sum, so to speak, do the computation. But for PEPs, often the computation is not actually doable and requires an additional approximation. So to give an example, this is a matrix product state overlap um, for L sites. And so it looks like this object with dimension with two objects along this, like with a so depth 2 along this axis and depth L along this axis. And I showed you you can contract it by contracting this with this and contracting this with this. So it's all very efficient. Um, but this would be a PEPs overlap. OK, so it's a sandwich now between the top PEPs and the bottom PEPs. Um, and each PEP is L by L for an L. So I'm considering a square lattice with L by L sides, to be precise. Um, and to avoid having to draw these complicated diagrams, I'm going to imagine that I've actually taken the sandwich and I've squished it together. OK, so the two slides I've read between one 
become one size of red, and I'm just going to think of it like this. Okay. So, so the goal, so a contraction of a PEPS involves evaluating this object, which means summing over all these bonds, and that's actually very complicated and cannot be done exactly in general, although it can be very well approximated. Okay. So here I bring down the PEPS, and let's just look at the problems of contracting. So. Uh, each, I've got all these bonds that I've mentioned chi. And let me just think about contracting, say, this tensor here with this tensor here. So I've just selected two tensors. There's a tensor at each vertex. And, then, and let me just consider contracting these two tensors. So if I take two tensors and the bond, they have bonds chi and chi, dimension chi and chi, and I glue them together, well, I get one tensor. But that one tensor has a bond which has dimension now chi squared, because because this horizontal bond really is two bonds that have just been stuck together. And you can imagine that if I keep doing this, the bond dimension when I'm contracting PEPs just grows exponentially. Okay, so so this is why contracting PEPs is not uh, a trivial matter. Okay, so um, so what do you do with this? So if so, I run I introduce a representation where where it looks like you can't compute anything, which is not very useful. Um, so a simple solution is to apply renormalization, um, which, in, in, which in the tensor network world is always called applying anisometry for reasons I don't. Uh, I don't know why there's a change in terminology, but it's the same thing. Okay. So what's an isometry? Um, so imagine that I've contracted two tensors to put them together, and that's like a tensor with a giant bond, a square bond. An isometry is just a mapping, it's this triangle here, which maps these two bonds approximately down to one bond. Okay, so, so I've taken this tensor with this big square bond, square chi square bond, and I've mapped it down to one bond. So I've approximately reduced it down to a simple tensor. So it's like a renormalization. I had something that was too complicated, and I changed it into something simpler approximately. That's kind of sort of coarse graining or renormalization. It's called an isometry because this is isometric in the sense that this is one. Okay. All right. So, um, so I can apply this general idea to contract a PEPs by applying isometries. So here is my PEPs network I'm trying to contract. And what you do is let me first contract in the let me let me contract condense two horizontal lines into one line. So I'm going to apply isometries along the horizontal bonds. These two bonds here are going to become one bond. So I get this picture here. Okay. So this is, I don't have the same number of squares, but otherwise these two bonds here are, be, are contracted into one bond, and these two bonds on the neighboring side contract into one bond. So I've inserted isometries into the network. I like, stuck them in the middle. And then I contract the isometries, and I obtain this lattice where half the horizontal bonds have been have, have gone. So it's a renormalization of the left. OK, and then I can do in the vertical direction, insert isometries, and contract isometries. And so I end up in this scheme with originally an, a computation on an L by L lattice, and I've mapped it down to a computation on, L, on 2 by L on 2 lattice. And then I can map it further down until the lattice is small enough that I can actually just contracted exactly by just doing the summations on all the bonds uh, explicitly. So, uh, so there are, of course, many ways you can insert symmetries. So, so that this is not a unique way. This is a very simple way to do it. And, and this is not actually the original way it's done. It's easy, easy to draw, and it's quite efficient to compute. And OK, and this introduces now. OK, so, so here I've introduced renormalization group as a kind of uh, simple way to algorithm to do this contraction of the pets. But of course, RG is a much deeper concept. So let me talk a little bit about RG and its concept and what it is in the world of entanglement. So RG is, of course, in some sense, the foundation on which 20th century, the second half of 20th century physics rests on. I mean, it's the way in which we're always doing an RG theory because we're always working with an effective theory. Um, and and uh, I should point out Ken Wilson, of course, passed away recently. I think the principal architect of the, of the of the idea of, the, of course, Michael Fish was also Canadian, he was very important, and he also did a lot of early work. Okay, so uh, RG is the way we understand many things, like critical phenomena, universality, um, but in, in a simple sense, it's also just a, a, a way of thinking about how you relate theories at different scales in a rigorous sense. Okay, 
So, um, so renormalization group ideas can be used not just as this computational tool, which I was showing to contract this complicated tensor network. It can be also used to construct a wave function. And uh, so, so let's see. And so I'm going to spend this last part of talk talking about how we construct the tensor networks using the RG. Um, and you'll be and you'll connect to things already. Okay. So a renormalization group can be used to actually construct a quantum state. So how would we do that? Um, so you, the RG always consists of, so we're going to use the real space version of RG. So I block things together, blocking, and then I coarse grain it, I decimate, block, decimate. So we, we've seen this in statistical physics. Um, and this type of blocking and decimation transformation is just applying isometry to a tensor network. So imagine that I have L sites at the bottom. I'm going to block them together and coarse grain them. So these two sites, which span for spins a Hilbert space of dimension four, you know, up, up, down, down, up, down, down, up. I'm going to coarse grain them into a smaller Hilbert space. Okay. And you can repeat this. So these are the renormalized states coming out. And I can do another, I can keep doing this. Okay. All the way until I get one state. So I have a mapping from the microscopic physics to the microscopic physics and the single state here is the macroscopic wave function. And they, I've introduced this additional dimension, which is the dimensional scale. Okay, so this is a simple, this would be the real space RG construction of a wave function. And it's just a tensor network, it's just a network of isometries. Okay. Yes? So the microscopic wave function, it, uh, it, it has a, uh, uh, it was N I, right? N1 to N. Yeah, so there's n1, n2, n2. So what, what is the uh, variable of the microscopic micro Well, it's got nothing coming out. So it takes in coarse grained bases and turns it into one state. Just so, so the ground state you're looking for? They say the ground state. So, so, so it's a wave function of the older. Oh, no, it's. Uh, so coming out here is a bond of dimension one, and it's a wave function that is a function of these two variables, the coarse grain states. Yeah. So it's like it looks like a wave function for two spins. Oh, okay. Yeah. So but these are two macroscopic spins. Into two spins. Yeah. Oh. Right. Two spin state. Two. The Hilbert space of two effective spins. Okay. All right. So this is the. Okay, so this, this is just real space RG, nothing very special about it. But we can ask the question, so this is an intense network language called a tree, for obvious reasons. Okay, but we can ask if that is actually how we would really want to construct the renormalization group uh, view of a quantum state. And so we're going to ask, what are the desirable properties of the renormalization group flow of a wave function? Um, so the so first property in, if I want to follow the philosophy of the renormalization group, is that the physics at higher scales should be decoupled from the physics at lower scales. And when I'm talking about the coarse grain long wavelength physics, I shouldn't have to worry about the details of the molecules underneath, say, in physical phenomena. So in the quantum state, it means the wave function at higher scales, those triangles at the higher scales, should only describe the physics, the entanglement, at the, length, at the long length scales and should be insensitive to entanglement at the lower scales. They should be insensitive to the triangles at the lower scales. Um, <coughs> another statement is that if I went to a gapless state, a critical quantum state, then the tensors, those triangles, should presumably be the same. Okay? They should be scale invariant. So you know in a critical system, it doesn't matter what look, scale you look at the thing, the physics is always the same. Okay? So that means the triangles should all be the same be self-similar. And you can ask if this is satisfied by this network. And, you, and the answer is no, but you can see why. So what we want is that this should only describe microscopic entanglement, this top tensor. And for a critical system, these should all be the same, all the way down. Triples all the way down. Okay. All right. So unfortunately, this test network doesn't actually satisfy these criteria for a good RG flow. Um, because if I think about what this triangle is doing, it is this isometry, to be more technical. It is describing entanglement between sites one and two and making an entangled state, some coarse grain state which carries the entanglement between sites one and two. And if I take this triangle here, it describes entanglement between sites three and four. Okay, but 
you can ask, well, what's describing the entanglement between sites two and three? Well, the entanglement between sites two and three is propagated to the next scale. Right. It's actually pushed up into the scale. So the microscopic entanglement is not actually described at the microscopic level, it's described at the coarse grain level. And if I look at these two sites, it's propagated all the way to the top tensor, which is not good. Okay. So, uh, all right, so in, in, a, in the RG language, it's a little bit like saying, well, if I think about the entanglement, this microscopic entanglement is never irrelevant. Okay. And just the imperial stuff, so in your scenario, actually, you will do have some assumption about the, this entropy is a point in the state. Or if it's unstable, I mean, if this point is unstable, you have some type of application in the magic flow. Yes, yes. So, um, so okay, so. Let, imagine that I actually sat on the fixed point. I could actually sit on the fixed point to all decimals of precision. Then you would agree that these tensors would be scale invariant. If there's a bifurcation, then you know, if it's slightly off, mm -hmm. then then you would you bifurcate this, these tensors would bifurcate into two categories. Right? One very one way or Okay, so, so in traditional RG language, you know that when you're coarse graining from microscopic to microscopic scales, you can throw stuff away, and then for certain observables, that stuff is unimportant to the long wavelength physics. It's irrelevant. But from the viewpoint of entanglement, the, the microscopic entanglement always propagates upwards, and it's not irrelevant. Okay, so we have to fix this, because this is not a proper RG flow. And you can restore the RG flow by modifying the tensor network. And so here I show the bottom, there's, there's stuff going up. You know, this is not the whole thing. There's still, you can put more stuff in there. But I can just make a slightly more complicated uh, tensor network where I intercept the in in entanglement between those sites which was, mis which was uh, not described correctly uh, before, it, it, before it goes upwards. So here, remember sites two and three previously had nothing to describe the entanglement. It had to be propagated up to this tensor. I just introduce, insert a new tensor here to intercept this entanglement. And this is called a disentangler because it disentangles the entanglement from one layer from the entanglement the other layer. I mean, these are just objects with indices. That's all they are. But you just write down your wave function with some additional tensors to contract. So this is a, typically it's shown to be unitary, but it doesn't matter. You can choose, it doesn't have to be unitary. Um, and so this disentangle enclosed correlations between sites two and three, and it removes it from the higher scales. And so what we've derived here is, in fact, the mirror. Uh, and let's look at the properties of this tensor network. Um, so uh, it's a kind of interesting looking thing. It's got these new objects, which weren't originally in RG. And let's look at its entanglement properties. So let me consider a region of L sites and ask how much entanglement is encoded in this tensor network for a region with L sites. So I'm going to take this tensor network and try and cut it out, anything to do with these sites, from the rest of the network. So I have to cut out all these bonds to separate these sites from the rest. If you count how many bonds have, have I cut, I cut, I cut something along this boundary. If this is of length L, the number of bonds is actually log L, order log L. And so I've written down a tensor network which, for a one-dimensional system, I've arranged my sites in one dimension, captures not just a constant amount of entanglement independent of the size of the system, it actually captures a logarithmic entanglement. And this is what is necessary to describe a critical or gapless state. Okay, so this is, a, this is one reason why we think of this web network as a good ansatz for gapless systems. And this is the mirror. Okay. All right, so that's the mirror. OK, so uh, I'll say just a couple words more about mirror, and then we'll look at a few quick applications. So uh, as you've noticed by now, drawing all these pictures is very tiring. So I, I borrowed some. I, I asked you if I could take some of his pictures. And you'll notice he draws things in, with different colors and such. So, so this is obviously a different picture. And this is obviously a different picture. It doesn't look the same as mine, but I don't want to draw this. OK, all right. <laughs> so, so let's just. Uh, Let's just uh, see if we, we're awake, okay? And so here's a matrix product state, and let's contrast it with the mirror. So for a matrix product state of site L, we're all probably okay with the fact that it contains order L numbers. Okay, each tensor has a set of numbers and the L tensors. Okay, so how many numbers are in the mirror? 
two things. Okay, does anyone want to guess? L log L. L log L? Yeah, it's not L log L, so who can, who can give the right answer? <laughs> <laughs> That's the, that's the thing that, that, that if you try to trick someone, you know, you want them to say L log L, because this is a very suggestive <laughs> thing. Okay. Also order L. It's so also order L, right? It's so also order L, because there's, the, the network is decreasing in size, so it's like adding a geometric series, you know, 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, you know, but it, it comes out as 2L for this mirror. Okay, so there's also order L. So mirror is not like this really logarithmically more complicated object than an MPS. It's just a constant factor, more information than an MPS to describe the logarithmic correction to the critical entanglement. All right, and uh, what about contracting this? Is it very complicated? So look at this awful thing that you have to put together. Um, but because we uh, use isometries, so that means that all the triangles contract to one. One is just a line. The chronicle delta is just a line. And these disentanglers, I'm going to use unitaries to make things simple. So a unitary disentangler, you contract it with its conjugates, also a line. Then the contraction of mirror is essentially trivial because you say, well, these two contract to one, these two contract to one, these two contract to one, and so on. Okay, so this is a contraction. All contracts to one, so I replace them by lines. All contracts to one, I replace them by lines. These contract to one, I replace them by lines. And then this thing itself, if it's normalized, it's one. Okay, so, so, so it's a reasonable thing to compute. Okay. Um, and just to illustrate uh, another difference with matrix correct states, let's just look at the correlations in the system. So a correlation between two operators, so it's a scary thing. So here's my bra on the top, and here's my ket on the bottom. Okay, and here are my two operators on site one and site L. I want to ask, what's the behavior of the correlations between these sites? And this looks like it's very complicated to analyze, but it's not really so bad. Mainly because most things contract to one. So this is a, this is a unitary in the bra, unitary in the ket, they contract to one. Isometry in the bar, isometry in the ket, they contract to one. The whole network looks like this when I've removed all the extraneous stuff in the middle. The only things that don't contract to one are things that are stuck on the operators. And then to think about the... Uh, how this behaves you, as a function of the distance, you, you think, have you ever played that game, like actually, actually often girls play this game, but it could be, I guess, any gender where you have some string and you, you, you move these strings around your fingers. Okay, so you kind of pull, you just think of this as making of rubber bands and you pull, pull the dots out, so you, so you make something like that, okay? You pull it out like this. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then you just, you, so this is the operator and this is the operator and there's some stuff in the middle. And if you ask how much stuff there is in the middle, the amount of stuff in the middle is the height of the mirror, which is log L. Okay, so there's order log L objects in the middle multiplying the two oper operators. These can be thought of as matrices. There's order log L matrices multiplying things in the middle. So, uh, so, if I, so each matrix can be characterized by its dominant eigenvalue, and so if I keep multiplying it out, I have uh, a correlation function which looks like uh, uh, okay. So there are log L terms, and so there. So well, I put in an exponential, but it's, it, this is just means I'm multiplying log L terms out, and so that that goes polynomially. Okay, algebraic. Okay, so so the mirror can uh, describe this algebraic decay of correlations that you also have in a gapless or critical system. Okay. There's a lot more to say about Mira. Uh, mostly stuff that uh, I, I don't really personally care so much about, but, but which is a lot of people do care about. So um, there's an additional dimension in Mira. And so if you're into holography, you can say, well, I create a theory that, that on the boundary, which is the physical sites, and now you have another dimension. So there's a bulk. Okay, so Mira provides an example of a bulk to boundary correspondence. And this allows us to make slightly more precise statements about ADS CFT. You know, if you're a string theorist, you kind of just wave your hands around, but here you can actually write down a concrete object where the, where the elements in the boundary and the elements in the bulk are actually explicitly uh, connected. And then there are other things, too, that one can think about connections with wavelets and so on and so forth. We can talk about that if you want. Okay, so let me just finish now with uh, just a very quick set of applications. 
Okay, so it'll just take five minutes. All right, so, uh, so the DMRG was introduced almost 20 years ago, more than, more than 20 years ago. And, and really, it, it provides essentially exact numerical answers for one dimensional lattice problem. In fact, last year, it was proved using ideas in the DMRG that the exact solution for the ground state of any one dimensional problem is actually only a polynomial cost. Okay, so for a quantum problem, you can prove rigorously that finding the ground state, not sort of in the physics sense, but you can prove mathematically rigorously that finding the ground state of a one dimensional gapped Hamiltonian is polynomial cost. Okay? So, but it's essentially like the DMRG, but with some tricks to make it uh, actually rigorous. Um, and so, in White's first DMRG paper, uh, it's a really nice paper. Actually, this is an interesting story. So, testing networks have had a hard time with the referees. Okay, so White's paper was rejected, and uh, the paper on PEPs was rejected, and the paper on Mirror was rejected. Okay, all three testing networks could not get published. Um, in the case of White's paper, it was rejected, but then after rejection, they retracted their rejection due to a late referee report. And as it turned out, that referee was actually Ken Wilson. And, <laughs> and <laughs> so, yeah, you know, Nobel already carries some cash in, so, so, so eventually got published. The PEPs paper has never been published anymore. Okay, so it could never get published. It only exists on the archive. And the mirror paper took more than two and a half years to get past the okay, So just to show you, if you get your paper published, it's not. You're in good company. If you, don't, if you get a paper rejected, you're in good company. Okay, like me. Okay, all the time. Okay. So here we go. Uh, so, so Heisberg, basically, because, I mean, most, uh, you know, the, the ideas when first presented seem very alien. And that's, that seems to be true. Good idea. Okay. So, if I, so in White's paper was both very good because it introduced this whole new sort of concept, and it also did an amazing calculation, so, which kind of showed you how powerful the technique was immediately. So if I just looked at the S equals 1 Heisberg chain, back in those days you didn't really know how to compute things. You do Quan Monte Carlo, and just by doing DMRG, you could actually obtain several orders of magnitude improvements, like two, two orders of magnitude improvements in the very first paper. And if I look at the Howden gap, you know, you know you get another two digits, and that's really amazing. So it was a real game changer from the moment it was introduced. At least once people realized that it was, uh, once they understood what was going on. So these days, if you have a one Dylanus problem, you shouldn't do anything else, right? You just do the much. I mean, that's, I'm not joking. That's a gap one Dylanus problem. Even if you have a gapless one, it is almost always the best thing to do. Yeah. Can you do finite temperatures? You can do finite temperatures. Okay, there are all sorts of things which are harder, like doing calculating the spectra, these are all harder, but there isn't something better to do. So, so in that sense, <laughs> you, should still, you should still do it. I didn't talk about finite temperatures and spectrum today. Okay, so most, I would say the more interesting applications in very recent years in DMRG have mainly been in systems that are not one dimensional, but actually two dimensional. And, and so you can ask yourself, well, well, didn't I just say that you should do with that this is a one dimensional answer? Um, but in the same way, you know, people do exact diagonalization, and that's kind of like a zero-dimensional answer. You know, it scales exponentially all the time. So if you do DMRG in two dimensions, it's fine. You just have to pay a lot of costs to simulate things that are very wide. But otherwise, it's actually a, a useful technique, and people have done that a lot. Um, and so it's very powerful when your two-dimensional system doesn't have very strong finite side effects. And so that means if you do spins, if it's a gap system, it's, it's definitely better than when it's a gapless 2D system. In one dimension, even if it's gapless, you can just still like brute force with DMRG, but in 2D, you typically want to create gap systems. And then if you're fermions, you want to be at large U in the Hubbard model, not, at, not so the fermions not very itinerant. But just an example, so this is the uh, spin half Kagame lattice. So this is, a, this is an example of a 2D DMRG calculation that is uh, was an important one uh, in 2D physics. Where in, in the Kagame lattice, it was thought up to this paper, the main candidate was that the ground state is a valence bond crystal, a, another gap state. Um, uh, but by doing just brute force DMRT calculations on cylinders, which are very wide, now you can do about 20 with 20, but the tears were up to 12, you could very easily see that the valence bond crystal is very high in energy, and this spin liquid state is far below any other competitor. So this was an important uh, demonstration that 2D DMRG and spin is very powerful. Of course, people always knew that who were doing DMRG, but this convinced a lot of people who weren't doing DMRG to do DMRG. 
So this, so this is a system which is a Z2 gauss system. Okay, here's another example. So this is in the 2D Hubbard model. So this is a good case where I work at large U. Okay, so and at half. So so this is data from the science collaboration. Do you know what that is? Um, at half filling, uh, the Hubbard model has no sign problem, so you can do Monte Carlo. So this is the sign free Monte Carlo. Just to show you that when you have no sign problem, it doesn't mean the physics is no, is that the numerics is all under control. You know, you still have error bars in the system uh, because it's all. They're not, the error bars are not small on the scale of the graph particularly, and in the thermodynamic extrapolation you have a large error bar. So these are DMRG calculations, and you just do them on cylinders of larger and larger size, and so they're all kind of quasi-2D systems, but when you extrapolate, you get thermodynamic limits, and they're basically within the statistical error bars of the example. And so this energy scale is pretty small. So this is a good example. Okay, other types of networks, let's look at PEPs. Okay, so PEPs have been around for about 10 years. Um, and they're very, com they're becoming, I mean, for a long time they just look so clunky to work with, it's just very hard to work with them, uh, basically you can't contract anything well, uh, but they're now becoming competitive with other, with other numerical algorithms in gap systems. So if I take a 2D spin system, this is the same Kagame lattice result, um, and this is using PEPs, and these are the PEPs as I increase the bond dimension of the PEPs, and the energy is going down, and this is the don't this number is not really correct, so it's, it's very misleading that the slide is here. But this is the best DMRG result. Okay, so you see that the, that the best PEP result, best DMRG result, are, are pretty similar, and this, these numbers are very small. You know, so um, so these days you, you can use PEPs uh, for useful things. Can we take this is the spin liquid phase. Is it getting spin liquid phase? Uh, this is the Kagame, uh, spin, spin half Kagame. Um, well, you, well actually, I mean, the well, question one can ask is what, you know, how well did they characterize the ground state? Um, and uh, it's not particularly well characterized, so I can't definitively say. I mean, for example, you should estimate the gap to say the gap, to say not gap state. So it's not a state with a band bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not like symmetry, it's not a band bond crystal. Yeah, but if not, you don't know it's the same state of the DMRG state. Uh, the, um, okay. So, for example, the work which led people to think it was a band one crystal is this result here. Okay, the series expansion, very high energy. So, despite the um, yeah. poor energy by a, maybe a little bit, you want to use PEPs because it's intrinsically two dimensional, isotropic, or I well. Guess. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, for the Kagame lattice, I would say that this is a system where you, you probably you should just, you know, DMRG is, is good enough and you should just do DMRG. But ultimately, there will be physics that you cannot get into the system by DMRG. And this is a demonstration that in the practical terms, PEPs is now a tool that, that can treat that type of problem. But this one is one, this is one of the er first PEPs results which is competitive with DMRG. That's uh, this is for fermions. Um, so again, you know, this is again in the large U limit. So this is a TJ model. So U is for infinity in some sense. Um, and uh, and this is to show that how competitive PEPs are. Um, so PEPs. Uh, this is looking if you dope this system. Um, there's competition between D-wave superconductivity and stripes. Um, DMRG calculation always shows stripes, and QMC competition QMC calculations always show D-wave superconductivity. Well, some D QMC calculations always show D wave. Well, most but most QMC is around system sizes that are too small to even capture that period, right? Yeah, so th this is, these are quite big. So the, there's 162 sites, and the periodicity of a stripe is typically eight. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the lattice here is it's like, it's true, it's not that big. It's like 14 by, smaller than 14 by 14. So you can still but you could imagine that you could see some mm -hmm. kind of asymmetry developing, but the QMC tends not to find that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but here there are PEPs calculations which produce different orders, and I don't remember W five is the stripe, and I don't remember what U and DAG are, but one is the D wave state, and this is the bond dimension. As you can increase the bond dimension, you can see all these different PEP solutions actually converge almost to the same energy, showing you that in the TJ model, the D wave order and the stripe order are almost the indistinguishable in energy. And very small biases in the calculation 
that's actually then DMRG using the cylindrical boundary conditions on QMC, you know, fixed node, fixed node approximation. These are the DMC calculations, so you can see that you can already go below the DMC calculation of energy. Very small things change there. What's the bulk increase? It's around 10%, but I don't remember exactly. It's an underdog figure. Yeah, fixed node. Uh, what kind of this is the ground state fixed node diffusion one in Carlo that Brian talked about at some point. In addition with releasing the node by two lateral steps. Okay. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, these things are just wave functions. And you know, perhaps most of you only care about model physics like lattice models, but it's just a wave function, so you can use it with realistic Hamiltonians. There's no reason you don't have to use it just a Hubbard model, a Heisenberg model. And so in realistic systems, uh, actually, so in realistic systems, um, actually DMRG is actually a metrical choice with strongly correlated systems. So if you go to chemistry, uh, then, uh, my background, then, um, then if I take a correlated material, which is like the oxygen involving complex in photosynthesis, what generates oxygen by far, uh, you know, it looks a bit like a manganite. It looks like this. Correlated system, um, then uh, then DMR is actually the method of choice for these problems. So they're not one-dimensional in any sense, but but you can, uh, you can it's a very powerful wave function answer to this ground of physics. Um, and I think that and and exciting direction is a combination of these tensor network ideas uh, with other numerical techniques. Um, so you already heard about uh, dynamical mean field theory from Christian. And uh, so one of the areas of growth is, is using these sort of transnational ideas as impurity solvers, um, because there's some things that kind of done well in the embedding framework, and some things which are just done well with tensor networks. So actually, the best embedding framework, according to me, since it's from me, but, but <laughs> assuming this is not a biased statement, the best <laughs> way to combine tensor networks with quantum embedding is not via dynamical mean field theory, which has there's nothing wrong with DMFT, but because the formalism itself is frequency dependent, it's a little bit inconvenient to combine tensor networks with it. So you can do everything in a frequency independent frame, in an entanglement frame. So this is estimation embedding. And this type of combination is quite powerful. So you can compute, for example, very, very accurate phase diagrams of the 2D Hubble model, which in terms of energy for the full phase diagram are, I believe, the most accurate for the, across the whole phase diagram. Um, and you can also do true realistic calculations. So this is on the calcium and copper oxide infinite layer material, this is a calculator of all electrons and all the atoms, and you can actually do a correlated calculation with tensor networks on it today. Okay. All right, so that brings me to the end, and thanks for your attention. Do we have any questions? Cyrus? Yes. Do you want to say anything about why for chemical systems the MRG works and how do you order your degrees of freedom in yeah. a non-one-dimensional system? Yeah, well, it works because it's a relatively efficient brute force formulate, brute force way of tackling the problem. So, you know, that it, it works in the absence of better alternatives. Um, so, uh, you know, if you take a, a molecule, it's a zero-dimensional object, you know, it's not really one-dimensional, you have electronic degrees of freedom all over the place, what you do is you take some proxy for how things are entangled. You typically just look at the matrix elements of the one of, of the Hamiltonian between two orbitals, and you rearrange the orbitals so that you don't have orbitals very far away, which have matrix elements that are very large. So that sort of maps it onto a pseudo-one-dimensional problem. Yes, yes, I mean, it's empty hard to do the mapping perfectly, but there are many, there are many uh, like, it's like traveling salesmen, right? I mean, there are many approximation schemes which are very cheap, which do a reasonable job. You don't have to get the perfect mapping. You just have to get a mapping that's not horrible, and then you just do the DMRG calculation on it. Um, there just aren't many, so the, the good thing about DMRG is, you know, or any of these things, is there's just one parameter in it, which is the bond dimension. And so you just crank it up, and you can, you know, you can, you know, you'll get to the right result. Well, once you've done this mapping. Yeah, once you've done this mapping, and so the fact that it's just easily systematically improvable is is what makes it so useful in non-one dimensional systems, and also the very numerically efficient. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you're 
Uh, why did Mira fail to get the Kakabe? Well, and the peps did nice and Mira did Well, Mira it, it's very computationally costly, and so we it, 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 it would. Uh, so uh, Giffrey did not claim that the mirror was uh, result was the true ground state. It was just a mirror calculation uh -huh. which produced this order. So somebody may do another mirror. Than yeah, there's no fundamental reason why you can't get the mirror. But I would say uh, I think it's correct to say that there are no calculate no practical calculations using mirror currently. For two D systems. For two D systems. For one D critical systems yeah. there. Yeah, so if you do a 1D system and you ask what is the correlation function, you know, one million sites away from here, the only thing which can do it is the mirror. Okay. Now, but if you're a DMRG type person, you would say, I, if I look at the correlation function 100 sites away, that's good enough. I can fit it to the correct function to get the behavior million sites away. Mirror person would say, well, but you're still, you know, you know it's still not quite right, you know, if I really want to. <laughs> so, this is the best in fitting the yeah, yeah, scaling, yeah. So for right, so that matters. It's really long tail matters if you're like looking at the, you know, in conformal field theory. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's correct. I have one more question up here. Uh, how important is your initial state in final DMRG? In the optimization? Yeah. Um, it can be important. It, it turns to be tends to be the case. And once I mentioned, the algorithm mm -hmm. is extremely robust and it doesn't really matter. But when people are doing these pseudo two dimensional calculations. The most common mistake is that they get stuck in the local minimum. And there's so much published data from people who everyone knows, who are well known, but not people like Steve or myself. But there are people who. <laughs> <laughs> where you just look at it and you can just see from, you know, that, that the calculation is stuck. Okay, this happens a lot in the fractional quantum core effect. Okay. Um, so uh, it does matter, and you have to be careful. So that's why the 2D simulations require a lot of care. So how do you go about determining the, the initial? Yes. Yeah, well, um, so for example, on, on the 2D Kagame, for example, Steve could construct all sorts of kinds of states to, so for example, he started the state in the valence bond crystal, and then it went away from it. Then it relaxed into something that had no crystal order. So you have to do a lot of checks to make sure you're not biasing it to what you're seeing. So in his case, he created all sorts of different like initial conditions and made sure that they all went to the same. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're doing really large 2D cylinders, you do have to be careful. All right, let's thank Aaron one more time.